Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this presentation on the impact of disasters on vulnerable human populations with backyard animals, presented by the UC Davis Campus Community Book Project. My name is Megan Macklin, and I serve as Associate Director of Campus Climate and Inclusion Initiatives in the Office of Campus Community Relations at UC Davis. Thank you for joining. While we meet today in a virtual space, we'd like to begin by reading the following statement that acknowledges the land where UC Davis sits. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Quetzal Dihi Band of Wintun Nations of the Clusa Indian Community, Quetzal Dihi Wintun Nation, and Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. To begin our event, a couple of housekeeping items. Captions can be accessed by clicking the live transcript button in your Zoom window. There you can show or hide subtitles and access the full transcript. Today's event is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Book Project website. When we turn to discussion, we encourage you to turn on your video. It's, a, it's great, especially for our presenter to see faces. And you are invited to ask questions or share comments at any point during the event in the chat. The UC Davis Campus Community Book Project promotes dialogue and builds community by encouraging diverse members of the campus and surrounding communities to read the same book and attend related events. The Book Project, a signature initiative out of the Office of Campus Community Relations since 2002, advances the mission to improve both the campus climate and community relations, to foster diversity and to promote equity and inclusiveness. Currently in its 20th year, the book project in 2021-2022 focuses on the theme of social justice and practice and features How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Our theme and selection have been supported by a year-long program of lectures, workshops, book discussions, film screenings, exhibits, performances, and more. This year's program is winding down with a few events left this spring. For more information about the book project program, please visit our website where you can find up-to-date event information, registration links, and other resources. We also welcome your involvement, students, staff, faculty, and community members in selecting the book project featured title and in planning our annual program. If you're interested in getting involved with the book project, please send us an email or refer to the book project website for more information. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Laís Costa is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine and Large Animal Internal Medicine, and a diplomat of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners and Equine Specialty. She received her veterinary degree from Sao Paulo State University, Brazil. She holds a master's degree from the Max Gluck Equine Research Center, University of Kentucky, and a PhD from Louisiana State University. Dr. Costa is the coordinator for the UC Davis Veterinary Emergency Response Team and has led the response to the 2021 Dixie and Caldor fires, 2020 LNU Lightning Complex and Bear slash North Complex fires, the 2019 Kincaid fire and the 2018 Camp fire. Dr. Costa, thank you for joining and please take it away. Thank you. Um, share my screen. Um, Hi, good afternoon. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, I regret that Dr. Michelle Hawkins will not be able to join us as a speaker because, uh, despite the fact that she had contributed greatly on the creation of this presentation. <clears throat> we both were very honored to receive <clears throat> the invitation to be part of this year's pro book project. Dr. Hawkins and I <clears throat> Uh, are part of the UC Davis One Health Institute at the School of Veterinary Medicine. We have responded together to wildfires in Northern California uh, through the UC Davis Veterinary Emergency Response Team. In today's presentation, I'm going to share bird's eye view on facts concerning the impacts of disaster in vulnerable populations and with backyard animals. By deconstructing the title in discussing the impacts of disaster in vulnerable populations and add, then adding the backyard animal component. So we'll start by defining disaster. So disaster uh, <clears throat> has 
being defined by many people and agencies. So in 2009, the United Nations defined disaster and that <clears throat> it amended in 2018 to add animals. And so the, the definition now reads a serious disruption of the functioning of a community or society involving widespread human, animal, material, economic, or environment losses and impacts which exceeds the ability of the affected community or society to cope using its own resources. So another way to define disaster is to look at cost. Um, so here there's a diagram from NOAA defining weather uh, and climate disasters in terms of billion dollars. So in 2021 was estimated that the, um, the cost of disasters uh, um, 105 billion dollars and that included storms, tornadoes, hurricanes in the southeast as well as the fires in the west coast. So kind of let's take the impact of disaster on vulnerable communities. So many federal, state, local and private entities are investing significant resources significant resources in disaster readiness, um, but they often disregard the special needs of vulnerable populations during disasters. So I think here, <clears throat> um, a manuscript from <clears throat> uh, the lawyer Sharana Hoffman, she's a professor of law, and she has written several papers concerning vulnerable communities and emergencies and looking at the sort of legal aspects and, and how it's overlooked. And she defines, she states that inadequate preparation for the needs of vulnerable populations can lead to catastrophic consequences. The disadvantaged could suffer large death tolls. Vulnerable groups may include individuals with disabilities, pregnant women, children, elderly, prisoners, certain members, of ethnic minorities, people with language barriers, and impoverished. So I am going to dial back in time and bring you to July 13, 1995, and to discuss the impact of extreme weather event in, a, in vulnerable communities. So the disaster is the heat wave in Chicago. When Chicago experienced extreme high humidity and a layer of heat retaining pollution driving the heat index up to 126 degrees Fahrenheit, it's 52 degrees Celsius. The out outcome was tragic. There were 70, um, 739 people that died over the course of that week. Most of them were poor, elderly, and many African Americans. So this event was captured by Eric Kleinenberg in his book, Heat Wave. It was published in 2002. He actually spoke to um, the Congress in 2005 um, about this event. And a couple months later, this uh, actually repeated itself. So we'll get that for this next event. So this also was captured in a documentary that was um, by Judith Health Health Fand, and she um, unfortunately I can't play the video, but the it's cooked, survived by zip code is the title of the documentary, and I have the link here in the corner, um, but this was uh, very uh, the impact of disaster in vulnerable community and how this extreme weather event was associated with global warming and climate change affect those communities and, and sort of encapsulate the culmination of environment, social and environmental injustices. So now I'm gonna dial to 2005, so 10 years after the event in Chicago. And that was shortly after uh, uh, Kleinenberg had spoke about the the event in Chicago and the vulnerable communities. And the event I'm talking about is in or happening August 28, actually that's 29, 2005. And here's the picture, uh, NOAA picture of the Hurricane Katrina. 
Now delve a little more in this notorious disaster, which culminated with the death of uh, 1800, over 1,800 people, most vulnerable population. So this is a infographic from about Katrina. I made a little correction there. So it's formed in August 23. It went through Florida. And so while well, I was hovering here, uh, Gulf of Mexico in 2008, in tw on the 28th, it was a category five, and then it made landfall in in, on the 29th. So here's a, uh, just the picture uh, of, the, of the hurricane coming to uh, South Louisiana here. So evacuation was voluntary on the 27th, and then 28th it was, was mandatory. And it made landfall on the 29th, early morning. So it, it didn't really hit New Orleans directly, but New Orleans is in a very complicated position because it's below sea level and is flanked by water bodies. So what keeps uh, New Orleans from not being underwater all the time are the levees, the levee between the Mississippi River and the Lake Pontchartrain. So the storm hit and um, New Orleans uh, uh, and the Shamak Gulf outlet and um, New Orleans was spared. However, in a few hours, the levees start failing and it starts submerging the city of New Orleans and greater New Orleans. So here is a picture of what New Orleans looked before and after the levee break. So 80% of the city was underwater. And, and here's another picture. So the remaining residents were um, trying to go to the rooftops. Some people actually found shelter in locations such as the Superdome, which here is a picture actually is on the right is the picture before and after. There was severe public health um, concerns because the temperature was very high and there was very poor sanitation and those bacteria, that bacteria rich flood water. And so it was uh, a very severe disaster. So the death toll of Hurricane Katrina was 1883 individuals that were unable to evacuate the city. The race and economic class of most victims, African Americans, elderly and impoverished. So this is another example of a natural disaster superimposed with superimposed on the man-made crisis of social and racial injustice and impoverishment. So, but there is another um, lesson learned from Hurricane Katrina, and that was the impact of disasters on vulnerable populations with animals. In fact, 600,000 animals died or were stranded in Hurricane Katrina. And, <clears throat> and largely, and it's estimated about 30%, uh, people did not the, of the evacuation failures attributed to animal ownership. So the evacuation buses for people that didn't have their own vehicle and the Red Cross shelters did not accept pets. So the pets were left behind and many people chose to stay with their pets and not evacuate. And so the cry for help underscored the importance of animals in people's lives. And he opened the eyes of emergency managers in the public that people will put themselves at risk for their animals. But they were not just pets that were stranded by Hurricane Katrina. Um, New Orleans was a, a, a very interesting city, had a lot of um, horses, there's a racetrack, and these obviously were evacuated, but there are a lot of just horses that people own and they ride, they used to ride on the levee, the carriage horses, People stay behind to fend for their horses. And people stay behind to fend for their farm animals. So many of those backyard animals were stranded, some were rescued, 
like this picture here for the team from the LSU and some perished. So after this disaster of Hurricane Katrina and the fact that many people put their themselves at risk because of their pets, uh, the Stafford Act was amended and to include pets. So Pet Evacuation Transportation Standard Act, acronym PETS Act, requires FEMA to support state and local governments in planning for animals in disaster. It also provides reimbursement for response to care, transport, and evacuate pets. It addressed the needs of individuals with household pets and service animals. This was also expanded and, um, and include other agencies. However, backyard animals were not, are not included. Does the evacuation, transportation, shelter and support for backyard animals remains limited. So now I'm gonna switch to impacts of wildfires on vulnerable communities. Our discussion will center on how wildfires affect vulnerable, vulnerable communities, as well as those in wildland urban interface and the impacts of, on the people and their animals. So since 2018, I've been involved in the response, recovery, and mitigation of the impacts of wildfires on animals and their humans in communities in Northern California. In fact, wildfires are a long lasting and frequent threat to California. But the recent fire events may pretend the new reality for the activity of um, fires along the west coast of the United States. So wildfires um, obviously affect greatly the forest is the free forests, free ranging animals. He also impacts rural communities. And when the fire reaches the wildland urban interface, often acronym is UI, it impacts the, the suburban and urban communities. So our discussion will center on wildfires in rural, rural, suburban, and urban communities in that UI or wildland urban interface. So this diagram here depicts the 20 largest fires wildfires in California and you can see that more than half of them happened in the last two years so the extent and the severity of the fires are increasing it's a um, undeniable fact and so in um, 2018 um, about nearly 2 million acres were burned in 2020, 4.3 million acres were burned, and last year, 2.6 acres, 2.6 million acres were burned. And so we responded to the fires here um, with the little asterisks. So kind of coming back to vulnerable communities, um, it's becoming more and more the awareness about how um, wildland fires among any other, all the other disasters affect, um, it mostly affect or affect negatively the vulnerable communities. This publication addresses that. And in this study, the researchers, researchers modeled the impact of wildfires in communities of color. And uh, so they look at the wild, fire hazard potential here on the right hand side of this diagram. Looking at wildfire likelihood in the wildfire intensity and on the left hand side of the circle they look what um, facts that they consider adaptive capacity which were facts related to socioeconomic status, language and education, housing and transportation and demographics. And um, so their conclusion was that 12.4 million people are particularly vulnerable to wildfire disasters, even if only under moderate potential for wildfires because of their poor adaptive capacity. 
And those include in the socioeconomic um, realm, impoverished, in, unemployed, and low income. People uh, in terms of language, they have low English fluency. In terms of education, um, people with less than high school education, people that lack their own transportation, people that live in mobile or multi-unit housing, and the elderly children, single parent homes, and uh, disabled people. So the CDC has created a tool to estimate hazard exposure and vulnerability and this can help emergency planning and management to address the different communities and their needs. So with this map, they use the census track, similar to that publication, and they rank um, an estimate social vulnerability index, and also they look at hazard exposure. And so you can actually go to individual counties or areas within the counties and find out their vulnerability and, and their hazard exposure. Um, so here is sort of the, what their explanation of social vulnerability index. And I'm just gonna zoom into what aspects they um, are ranking the socioeconomic status, household composition, housing and transportation, race, ethnicity, and language, much similar to that publication by um, Oregon State. CalOES2 has a sort of um, way to monitor uh, the access and functional needs and try to help. Um, Emergency planning, emergency planning and management to address those needs. So now we're gonna. So there is there is this attempt to address the vulnerability of uh, populations. Obviously, we we have in in California we don't have a very large. Uh, African American population, they tend to be more in urban areas and not in the rural communities. Uh, nonetheless, they can be impacted in those, um, the wildland you know, urban interface. And Latinos and um, Native Americans are severely impacted. So, and they do have um, backyard animals. So here, there, you know, those uh, the our animals are affected by disasters or wildland fires in California has made the news. So here, firefighters remove in every disaster, we, the every wildfire, we see firefighters uh, rescuing or evacuating animals that are not endangered, but that they people cannot have access to care for them. Here's a picture of a veterinarian at the campfire uh, rescuing animals. So the truth is that the animals that are left behind, they have three fates. They either are well sheltered in place and they survive, or they are sheltered in place and not injured, but they can be evacuated or they have to be rescued because they are in danger. And we have had several teams going in those search and rescue um, missions. And unfortunately, there's the devastating sight of some of those animals left behind. And I was debating if I should show some of those pictures, but I think people ought to know. <laughs> so here's another, um, very, I mean, the landscapes completely destroyed and animals that were left behind did not survive. So I'm going to take a, a, give a little um, more of our experience in those disasters. So the UC Divert responded to, as I uh, said before, several uh, wildland fires in the last few years. Here are the 
the fires we responded since 2018. So the Camp Fire, Kincaid, LNU, Lightning Complex, North Complex, Calder Fire, and Dixie Fire. And the Camp Fire was a very fast moving fire. I'll talk a little more in detail about the Camp Fire later. Uh, it is the, the most destructive and deadliest because it was in a, it hit that uh, wildland urban interface and actually wiped out the town of Paradise. So there were over 18,000 uh, structures destroyed and 85 people actually perished. Um, the Kincaid fire, what people really uh, evacuated early, there was a, uh, after the, the terrible um, memories of the camp fire in 2019, people were very proactive and it was not as, it was a, a fire that was handled um, more easily, less severe. And overall 2019 was not as severe a year, but 2020 and 2021, that uh, these fires were very large. Um, they were very destructive, not as destructive as the campfire. And they did cause uh, the ones in 2020 uh, were the fifth and the 16th deadliest fires in the California history. So if we look at our response, and this is who comes to the live, to the livestock shelters, or emergent, temporary emergency shelters. And just to give you an idea what animals come, and obviously the product, commercial productive animals don't come to a shelter. Uh, um, those properties uh, have insurance, they have emergency plan. So they actually do not um, end up in a livestock shelter. So what we see in the shelter are the backyard animals. Um, and so backyard poultry, backyard livestock, backyard equids. And so here's a breakdown. So in, in the X axis are the fires and the Y axis are the count of animals. And we have separated by the incident and um, the year. So if one thing that's, uh, kind of, you can gather right away is this yellow. Yeah, we yellow are avian species. So green are equids, horses, donkeys, mules. Blue are ruminants and camelids, so sheep, goat. Rarely we get cattle. Um, if we do, they're the backyard cattle. They're not uh, large operations. And uh, pigs. And so you see there's a lot of yellow except 2019, when we had the virulent uh, Newcastle outbreak and chickens or poultry was not allowed in the shelter. So the small number of avian were exotic animals. But you can see the, that avian um, is a large um, group in those large animal shelters. So the question, so we have here picture of our team there's dr michelle hawkins with the uh, student volunteers triaging animals dr hawkins and uh, christina palmer caring for burned um, poultry from the campfire one thing i do want to highlight is that even though those are backyard animals and they fall into the sort of semi-pat <laughs> they are still food producing animals so they have to follow the Food Animal Residue Avoidance Data Bank, or FARAD, uh, for medications. And medications have only can only be used if they're allowed in food producing animals. And the withdrawal times are important. When we're in a shelter, we have to report the withdrawal times for those medications. So why so many chickens? So this is why there is an explosion of um, backyard poultry in recent years. There's a um, paper from 2014, uh, sort of with the census, if you will, of um, poultry, backyard poultry. And you see California stands out. And this is a more recent here on the, on the right-hand side map of California 
with the operations uh, backyard poultry operations. So there are a lot of poultry out there. And so, and those are rural communities and some um, urban uh, communities that have um, those animals. So what's the path for resilience? The path for resilience is preparedness. And we hear that a lot. And so if you, if you look at preparedness in terms of a timeline of disaster, is preparing before the incident by preventing um, against pro, uh, protecting and mitigating the effects uh, during the incident, it comes the prepare, it comes the response. So preparing to respond is a lot of what we do. And um, post-incident is the recovery. So the recovery actually starts when, once you start responding. And so for animals that are owned, that portion of identifying the animal uh, and being able to find the owner is crucial and uh, so all those have to be uh, taken into account from the get-go so educating people to um, what's the best way to protect their homes and, and etc but how is the best way if they can evacuate their animals if they cannot what do they do and making sure that at the end here in this recovery phase that we can reunify the animals with their owners. So the key is to improve disaster preparedness is developing and implementing educational tools that will help equip backyard livestock and poultry owners in vulnerable communities to create personalized emergency disaster plans. But it has to be personalized. That's an important thing for proper evacuation or a shelter in place when evacuation is not possible. And then, and thus improving reunification and recovery outcomes. And so there's a lot of material out there teaching, you know, uh, aiming to educate people in preparedness, you know, and making their property uh, ready for the fire season. Um, and it's important that they're not just in English. So the CAL FIRE has um, information. The UC uh, ANR has information. There are a number of, uh, of uh, resources out there. The question is, does they get to the vulnerable populations? That is the key. In terms of preparedness that includes animals, there's a lot of material out there too. CAL FIRE has um, publications printable, you can find it online too. Uh, CDC has, CDC addresses most pets, a lot of those uh, address pets. Um, AVMA has disaster preparedness series, saving the whole family to include all four-legged and two-legged feathered pets. Um, UC Days Veterinary School has um, resources as well for several species. So there are, there are resources online and the key is to have all those resources online and printed in other languages. So here is FEMA, uh, the ready.gov. A lot of them talk about pets, not so much about backyard animals. The, the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis is developing a wildfire resource app for Android phones and um, uh, iPhones potentially, but Android phones might be more accessible to vulnerable populations to help people prepare and during the fires to know what to do. So I'm gonna give you a little story. So this story is about the campfire. I didn't go into much detail about the campfire because I reserved this for the end here. So on November 8th in the morning, it's kind of a brisk morning, a fire sparked in a remote stretch of a canyon in Butte County. And it was a uh, called Paradise at, at the area, the urban area nearby, nested against the western slope of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And 
because of the the drought and the powerful gusts of wind in the location the flames grew and traveled very rapidly and um, so here is what the city the town of paradise became after the campfire went through it's not much left the speed of the fire was incredible it was one football field per second so it's very hard to evacuate people and their animals in a fire that moves that fast and there's only one a out way out of that canyon so 40,000 people were displayed, 14 homes were lost, 18,804 uh, 18, structures were destroyed, 85 people perished. This is the deadliest um, fire in the history of California. So we were, we, uh, were uh, requested and activated, and we came to, on November 10th, we came to the livestock emergency shelter at Gridley Fairgrounds. So here's kind of the animal count um, in the fairgrounds. Um, not at the beginning, the beginning there were very few animals, but um, again, you can see that uh, near, out of nearly a thousand animals, more than half of them were avian. A lot of poultry in those rural communities. And a lot of those animals were burned. A lot of the ruminants, the pigs were burned because they don't flee as effectively as equids do. So a lot of the burns were in uh, poultry, small ruminants and pigs. So this is the story. So this rescue trailer had four goats that were rescued from a property where everything was burned into rubbles. Those four goats were, th there were four goats burned, but one of them was severely burned. And actually, uh, she, we couldn't examine her eye. It was, it was so swollen. She couldn't breathe, so we're trying to create an airway here in the trailer, just working uh, with her on the trailer. And um, she has severe burns all over. So, um, the rescuers had been called, we just found that as we were working in there, the rescuers were to call the owner. The owner had requested the rescuers to go to their property because they knew the prop, they tried to shelter the animals in place and left in an area that had water and it was sort of uh, somewhat clear of um, um, trees. And to try to give the best chance for those ghosts to survive. So um, the owner, Jim Clark, um, was notified that they actually did find the 18 goats, that 14 were okay, but four were burned. And so he came to the fairgrounds and he actually did not recognize this um, goat. It was his kind of, um, it was the leader of the, of the herd and but she recognized him and so he came with the rescuers to the vmt so we cl cleaned her she was struggling to breathe and then she was referred immediately to the veterinary medical teaching hospital and here is her she was still hospitalized um a month uh, 20 days later and so um this has a, a great ending she made it back um, to her family as uh, her leader. She still she has the scar where the, all the burns were, and she's still gonna have those scars. No years can go out on the rain, right? Um, but this was a story of survival and hope, and so what? Um, that happens in every disaster. And so every disaster, we have those stories of animals left behind and that we can reunify them. And even if we can't reunify them, for people to come and see that their animals, they can't handle having the animals, but we'll care for them until they have a second chance to have a home. 
And so bringing that closure to people help them cope with the disaster. So we believe that to build the resilience in vulnerable communities, the disaster preparedness and response need to address the social vulnerabilities of the affected community, including the inequalities of racial injustice, but taking into account the animals. The taking account uh, the animals translates to supporting community, especially that are underserved and lack adequate access to veterinary care. And so um, this is kind of our motto by caring for animals in the community. We bring hope and help build resilience in the community. And I want to thank you everybody for, for the talk, uh, listening to the talk. And if you have any questions, here is uh, myself, my email and Dr. Hawkins email. And this is our partner in crime, Dr. Megan. So I am going to open this for questions. So I invite folks to pose any questions, share any comments you might have in the chat, or you are welcome to um, unmute yourself and ask your question. I can get us started, Dr. Costa, and I want to, um, I just wanted to make a note to you. I'm not sure if you had turned off your video intentionally, but we're seeing a lovely picture of you with what looks like a donkey and not your live face. So I just wanted to share that with you. Okay, there you are. Okay, here um, I am. Hello. <laughs> so the, the question I want to ask, you know, I really appreciated how you discussed how after Hurricane Katrina, there was legislation and, and you know, um, new, um, new legislation enacted that included pets. Um, that specifically recognized pets and the need to evacuate pets, but you noted that that did not include um, the backyard animal category. And you also talked about preparedness as being, you know, really key in the step towards, you know, even before a disaster strikes. Do you, are you aware of any tangible resources for folks, such as funding, for example, to help with preparedness? Because, you know, as I, I think we all can agree, it's, Certainly having information out there is a resource, but really when it comes to, you know, if you don't have a vehicle, if you don't have something that would be appropriate for sheltering your animals in place. And um, yeah, I was hoping to, to hear more about that or if you know if there's kind of any efforts in that area or areas where people can perhaps take action. Yes, absolutely. And there are, and, and so there are. So I, I didn't say so in sort of all emergency management, the idea is that disasters uh, start and end locally. So FEMA or the state or federal agencies step in when the local resources are overwhelmed. So the more prepared, the less chance that you're going to overwhelm your resources, right? So the local communities have been working on um, creating resources. And there is what we call the Community Animal uh, Response Teams, CARTS for short. And sometimes they have different acronyms, but they are kind of hand in hand with the CERTs, the Citizen Emergency Response Teams, in terms that they take training. And part of their work is to educate people, help people, some, some communities, some counties are very organized and they identify people that have animals in no transportation and they create a evacu those evacuation teams. And so the, the problem is the communities that are not as organized and the more uh, underserved and, and um, more disadvantaged chances are of having those organized groups is less. And so we hope that UC Davis actually will add that uh, component, especially to those areas where there is no um, or there's limited um, preparedness efforts and mitigation efforts in the pre-incident phase. But there are in the with the worsening of the fire seasons, we see there are more groups organized. There are a lot of nonprofit. Uh, rescue groups, animal rescue groups that are having initiatives. And there is sort of this, this trend to organize people. So those more affluent counties that have organized preparedness evacuation for, for uh, livestock, that they will 
lend a hand for those net less advantaged counties or areas in the county to be able to develop their own um, strategies and their own planning. Does that make sense? Thank you. So again, want to open up the floor to our audience if you have any questions and feel free to unmute yourself, ask any questions in chat. I can eat, keep asking some if we don't have any volunteers or you know, if people are still thinking about their questions, but, but I'll, I'll give it a couple of seconds. Megan, before you go forward, uh, this is Michelle Hawkins. And um, hey, I just wanna say first off, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there today with Lais. Uh, for this talk, because this talk was very near and dear to both of our hearts uh, as we were trying to put this together earlier. But the thing that I wanted to add in about preparedness is this is one of our biggest challenges right now, because yes, there's a lot of tools out there, but can all the vulnerable populations get to those tools? That's what we're always worried about. And are those tools in a language or in a format that they can understand and interpret uh, to be able to utilize for their animals. It's really easy to put out there and say, oh, you need to have a go bag with all these things and you need to have a trailer to be able to move your animals. But that's not always going to be available, especially in these vulnerable populations. And I think that as Dr. Costa and I, the more we look, the more we realize how incredibly privileged not only we are, and that UC Davis is in that the populations that are getting the help overall, for example, the companion pets, you know, those are gonna be areas where they could be broad strokes and that one stroke can fit many more people. Um, whereas when you start to talk about backyard populations of animals and, you know, the, the whole point of this is that they are a food source for these vulnerable populations. Whereas for like for the state of California and that map that Dr. Costa showed uh, of, of in 2014 of the number of companion backyard poultry that were kept, they were kept for eggs. They were definitely kept for food, but they were kept for companionship. And these were in very privileged households that were buying their chicken coops, you know, from Williamson Sonoma and things like this. Um, obviously that's, that population has computers, they have time to go and read up on things, you know, that other vulnerable populations may not have. And so trying to give those populations tools that, that are useful to them are what is the most important. And so here in the extension service uh, for the UC extension service uh, has been building this Android app that Dr. Ta Costa was talking about um, for, for backyard poultry primarily, but we believe and hope that it could be extended out to other backyard populations of animals as well. Um, that started Android because we felt like vulnerable populations would be more, you know, would be, that would be more accessible for them, but it also has to be in multiple languages. And so there's so many pieces and layers to providing this preparedness. And it's really easy to get one level or two levels done and managed. And that's what uh, Dr. Koska and the whole VERT team was doing from the beginning. But then you start to see these nuances and the nuances are where we hope we can help people, but we know this is where people are falling through the cracks. Yeah, that's a, a good expansion to what we were saying. Um, and like uh, I wanted to add some communities have for each um, that actually work on trying sort of this educational piece. So it, being able to get into the communities and um, understand their needs. There are several communities that we deployed to that had no access. There are no veterinarians. There was very limited veterinary care access. So those animals were not vaccinated. There, I mean, but those people had issues 
for of themselves, but they were they didn't know the things that they could have, and obviously they weren't making a go bag for their animals. But they wanted to save their animals, and they put themselves in danger for that either because they 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 delay their departure or because they try to go back um, before it's allowed to to actually go find their animals. So. I think it's important that the personalized planning, you know, you can put everything in a in a piece of paper or app. you people we have to deliver that to people and creating a sort of a, a expandable way that we can do that, we go use the education arm to actually create that kind of so the 4 H or working in schools. Is, is a way to do that, that we are hoping to be able to, um, to tap into. Thank you. And thank you so much, Dr. Hawking, for your contributions to this conversation. Um, I just want to call out something that was put into chat. Thank you so much for this presentation and the important work you do. This was so enlightening, bringing awareness of vulnerable populations in the struggles faced in times of crisis is a great step to assuaging the negative impacts of disaster. Thanks so much for putting that in chat. So I was wondering, you know, um, Dr. Costa and Dr. Hawkins, you both talked about if the, the difference between broad brush strokes that could affect a large population in a particular community versus needing to have a really personalized plan. Um, knowing that we might have some folks in the audience today or folks who later view this video uh, recording who are practitioners or who go out into communities and see folks who are animal owners, are there certain, I guess, um, elements in that personalized plan that you would really emphasize as being kind of the key starting points? Like if you're going to start with one thing, here's the one thing that we would recommend you to start with for your personalized plan. Or are there, um, I guess, integral components that would be really important that folks could have as a priority as they're making their preparedness plans? One critical thing that comes up is a, an added identification of the animal. So we can rescue the animal, care for the animal, but if we don't reunite them, that piece is missing. For that person, the lack of closure, if the animal, uh, if that person may not be able to take the animal back, if they lost everything, they rent a house, they can, they gonna have to move, they live in a mobile home, they rented mobile home, they may not be able to take the animal, but being coming and seeing the animal and say, okay, my animal will have a second chance and I'm gonna find my second chance is crucial. So that um, identification of the animal is important when we reunite them or if it's just to identify that they perished and the person say, okay, I'll stop looking for them or I won't be able to take them, but I trust that, and they, we hear a lot of that. People say, I trust you will find a good home for them. And we, everybody in the disaster, animal disaster, um, deeply are committed to the well being of the animals. So they will find good homes. And so having that person come in and that sense of, um, taking that burden off of their shoulder is crucial. So um, I think that ha having a way to identify the animal is very important. Microchipping is one thing. And in some communities, we when we after we go to the disaster, then we start microchipping the dogs, the cats, the, the horses. Some people microchip even small ruminants and chickens. So the fact having that, um, is important. Um, they have to know that they have to update the information in the registry. So we, otherwise we can't, we get the microchip number, we can't find the person. Uh, sometimes personal uh, uh, um, visual identification, uh, leg band or a color, something that people can uh, see or ear tag, um, tattoo, Whatever that is appropriate for that species might be uh, tattoos, obviously, are visible and permanent. But the idea is to having the animals 
identify. That's important. The second thing is for them to understand what can they do? Can they get transportation? Are they in a county that will have evacuation teams to come and help them? They can create a network of phone uh, uh, um, lists that people can, if they don't, they learn how to create a, a defensible space in, to shelter the animals in place so they can fend for themselves in a, in, and have a best chance to survive until somebody can get back to them. When they get out and leave the animals behind, communicate where they are so the search shelter in place teams can come back and feed and water and check and decide, okay, we have the ability to evacuate the animals if they're not well or if the access is not conducive to come and feed and water them, we will evacuate them tell the person to come to the shelter to tech, to get their animals or if they're going to leave the animal in the shelter. So having those conversations, have people thinking about, that's why I think it has to be personalized and I think you have to have use an educational outlet that you expand that um, through, I think, um, youth is uh, that are committed to agriculture animals is, is a really um, uh, how do you say, um, convenient <laughs> or useful or efficient way to get that. Yeah, and I would add to that um, for Dr. Costa is that the, the more we have responded, the more we have realized how these differences in response can be for these different populations. And, you know, for you know, our dear friends in um, Sonoma County, for example, you know, they have the fanciest chicken breeds on the planet and they eat the eggs, of course, they would never even think that that animal could possibly be, you know, the chicken they put on their plate, right? And they're going to have a trailer so that they can evacuate those animals. Those animals are going to be microchipped. It's, we need to be looking at these vulnerable populations that aren't going to have those abilities to do those things, either up front or even on the back end. And so uh, working with social services in terms of understanding the socioeconomic issues, if so many times we heard, I've lost everything, I wasn't insured, there is no way I'm going to go back to where I am, you, you need to help me to find homes for my animals. That is one thing we can do. We are good at finding homes for animals uh, as veterinarians. But the point is, is was that animal a food source for the, that family? And how is that now going to be filled in for them? Are they gonna have to go now and spend $5 or $6 a dozen for eggs that they didn't even think about before? And that may have been a primary protein source on their table every day. So these animals are protein sources as well as pets. And uh, I think that having the ability to really think around those corners, to talk with those people about that part of the loss as well is gonna be, you know, it's continuing to grow every year as we respond more and more. Thank you so much. I, I want to uplift a couple of the kudos that are in chat, um, this opportunity to, to learn about being a vulnerable population that maybe isn't um, at the forefront of the conversation when we're thinking about social justice. Um, I, I know that other folks in our audience and myself certainly really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you, Dr. Costa, for your talk. Um, thank you, Dr. Hawkins, for jumping in and providing your perspective as well. So I see we're at time. So I'm just going to close us out by sharing some um, final information with the group. So we hope um, that folks will have an opportunity to join us for our final book project event of the quarter and of the academic year um, as it's currently scheduled. Next Wednesday, April 12th at 4 p.m., Matt Connor, who is a student services librarian and Beth Borick, or the director of the Redwood Seed Scholars Program, will present on the community integration of intellectual disability. UC Davis brings post-secondary education to California. All are welcome at this free event. It is in person, so we do ask that folks remember to please come with an approved daily symptom survey. And finally, we hope that folks will provide feedback on today's event 
and we invite you to complete a brief survey, which you can access via the QR code on the screen or the web address as an incentive. And thank you for your participation in their survey. At the end, you will have an opportunity to enter into a prize drawing for a copy of next year's book project selection, which we hope to announce in the coming weeks. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Dr. Costa. Thank you as well, Dr. Hawkins. And we hope to see you at a future program.